Hello guys, welcome back to the channel. We're here today with Dr. Sarah Pugh, a lovely lady also from England, who I'm going to be talking today about quantum physics and its impact on health and fitness. How are you doing today? Well, I'm great, thanks. I was thinking about you just now because I've just come back from a workout in the gym and, you know, I was thinking in my head, what are we going to talk about? Because we could talk for about three hours on everything from food to training to supplements to sleep to light. So I'm really looking forward to talking with you um, today. Great stuff. Um, so for anyone that isn't sure who you are, for whatever reason, I don't know why, um, who are you and what do you do? What, what do you like to talk about? Okay, I'm Sarah, and I just say I'm a biochemist, a hypnotist, a quantum biologist, but I've also worked a lot in movement as well. So it would range from something like Z Health, which is individual joints, to Pilates, all the way up to Olympic lifting and gymnastics. So I, I've sort of had 10 lives already and been 10 different people and been wrong loads of times as well. So my favorite thing to talk about at the moment is looking at biology through a physics lens or a quantum physics lens. And it sounds terribly tedious, but it actually makes things a lot more simple. And a lot of it during our education, a lot of important things are hidden from us. We're not taught them at school or it's just glossed over and made extremely boring and irrelevant. And it helps me to sort of sift through what's the BS and, and what's probably correct. But obviously, I also have clients and I can test things on myself. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, I can see the value in it more and more as I slowly but surely get a little bit older as the years go on. Um, but how do you become interested in, like, you know, the biology, the quantum physics and fitness? Like, what kind of things stuck out to you at a certain point in time? It's like, well, I need to look into this a bit more. Well, I, I suppose in terms of movement, I've always liked sport and movement, and I've loved martial arts ever since I was about eight. Uh, and I've always done and been interested in movement. Uh, and again, there's a lot we could talk about with biomechanics and what's actually going on and the neurotransmitters. But when it comes to quantum biology, a lot of this focuses around light, water and magnetism. And I did do a PhD in biophysics and molecular mechanisms, but like school, none of the physics I learned I could apply to daily life, but it gave me an understanding. So I think it's like most people, it, um, I'm very curious, but also lots of things didn't work, like a variety of health ideas or weight loss plans or trying to improve it mainly focusing around clients because yes i have my own goals and things i want to do but a lot of the time you meet people and they look like they're doing everything right but then their health and body and brain says otherwise so that's sort of my reasoning behind looking at light water and magnetism because obviously we are surrounded by light and for most people they just think it's this thing that they can it makes them be able to see in their room and that we have a sort of a big problem with junk light, same as junk food, as well as people being inside too much and not connected with the sun. And then with water, again, we're sort of a water being because we're 99 molecules of water and one of human or about 65 to 70% water. So it's obviously something important that we ignore. And then on another level of being a human, we're, we're an electric being. And just in terms of sort of electronic devices, the, the better the current flow in an electronic device and the more circuits there are, the, the better it's going to work. And that's not dissimilar to how our brains function. And again, movement and exercise, especially the more complex movements, say when you get into competitive sport or gymnastics or something where you've got to think, the amount of brain power you need to move is much more than we'd think and people just think about exercise as something that their body does whereas actually their brain's doing it uh, and then water is obviously vital because first of all from dr gilbert ling's work we are fundamentally a water battery of semiconductors and i won't go massively into this unless the, the subject sends us that way and that just means that if we lose water, we, we're going to run into health problems, whether it's being tired, having pain, not moving properly. Um, so that's where the water comes in. And then the magnetism side, j just in simple terms, if we think about the mitochondria, which is the battery in our cell, and it does a lot more than making ATP, water and heat. Uh, it's actually magnetic because the ATP is in its spins at a 90 degree current. So fundamentally, we've got a little magnet running our cells. So it obviously has to be important. 
and then oxygen's magnetic, so is blood. And oxygen and blood are important for, for, for sort of movement and exercise. So, so again, just looking at things through a slightly different lens, because obviously with exercise, you want to enjoy it. You want some kind of result. So, so again, we were talking about clients who just want to look good. That, that's fair enough. We, we both have clients that are athletes. They, they obviously want to perform better. But then one of the fundamental problems with sport is people exercising in really terrible environments and not resting and sleeping properly. So, so again, understanding quantum physics and electrons and, and ha how they relate and how light relates to how we sleep is really important for people to be able to recover. Because if you can't sleep, you can't repair, you can't produce growth hormone, you don't produce melatonin properly to repair your mitochondria, you can't do autophagy, you can't detox, you can't deplete deuterium. Uh, and that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're a, a, like a, a 10 year old, a pregnant mother or an athlete. If you can't sleep, it's going to really affect your quality of life. I completely agree. Yeah. I mean, what I've always told people is recovery is the bottleneck when it comes to gaining muscle, losing fat, exercise performance. You know, we can all train really hard. We can spend four hours a day in the gym doing lots of different things. We can eat loads of protein, lots of steaks and eggs and things. But when I speak to a lot of people in consultations, I'm sure you kind of notice this as well. Oh, how do you sleep at night? How do you recover? You know, what's your, your daylight exposure? What's your blue light at night exposure? Um, they got it all kind of mixed up. And I think that could be the key for a lot of people in terms of improving their, their health and fitness. And um, obviously... That will then turn over into longevity. Um, now, my next question is about kind of like the benefits of how are you going to apply all this kind of stuff? So the light, water, magnetism um, to, towards improving, you know, muscle gains, fat loss, exercise performance, things like that. How does that come into it specifically? Okay, so, so first of all, um, with light, it doesn't just control our um, sleep and wake cycle. Our sex hormones are light-driven. And anybody who's interested in muscle gain, they're obviously going to be wanting more testosterone, the right amount of estrogen for their gender, enough progesterone for their gender to sleep and relax, enough DHEA for multiple uses, and too much exposure to blue light all day just in simple terms is going to tank the testosterone it's going to push estrogen up and that's not a good idea for men or women it's worse for men because no man wants to have sort of man boobs or anything and yes diet contributes to that as well but also light does too just too, too much blue light and constantly on your phone or working out in a gym constantly never opening the windows or never working out outside. It's just not the best recipe for your hormones. And also the converse with red light and sunlight, that actually boosts testosterone. It sets your circadian rhythm. So um, it's not really good enough to just ignore the sun and just use a red light panel. Yes, it, it can help, but it's not the sun. And just looping now into sort of fat loss, uh, leptin is a really important hormone for regulating body weight. And yes, there are things you can do regarding when you eat and sort of not snacking, not eating before bed. But, but fundamentally, it's a circadian hormone. So if you've got a terrible body clock that you never see the sunrise, you, you don't ground, you don't go out um, regularly, you don't open windows, you're going to lose your circadian uh, rhythm. And if you lose that, every single cell in your body has got no idea what time it is. So it's really confused. And when cells are confused... We just call it chaos in terms of quantum physics, and that's just another term for inflammation. So, so we, we do want controlled inflammation for muscle growth, but then uncontrolled constant inflammation is just a recipe for fat gain. So there are other w reasons for fat gain as well. Uh, with, with leptin, it's also sort of a, an energy accountant. So it, it basically measures how much energy you have on board. So it doesn't look at body fat because it doesn't know what that is. If it's not working properly, it's going to look how much electrons do you have and how charged are they with light and how big is your water battery, how much vitamin D have you got and how much melanin have you got. And it's going to compute all of those. And if it senses like an energy problem, it's just going to make you try and get more and more electrons and energy from food rather than just managing itself because we only get 30% of our electrons from food anyway. So if we're short of electrons from elsewhere or our electrons are not charged up properly from light, our bodies 
or our brains are going to start wanting to try and make up this deficit with uh, overeating. And also the, the leptin controls actual met metabolic rate as well. So it, it's got a handle over insulin. It's got a handle over thyroid. So um, we, we all know people who are in this situation. They're doing everything right, but they're still stuck or they're hungry all the time when they shouldn't be. And th that's where understanding quantum biology can be really helpful for people because otherwise they're just fighting their own hormones. They're eating less and trying to work out more. And then they're just making the thyroid worse where that's not even the problem. The problem is they're not outside grounding enough because you can get electrons fr from grounding. They're all dried up because they're playing with tackle all day when they're not trying to work out and lose weight and they're drinking horrible water they, you know, they haven't filtered it they have oh, sorry they haven't distilled it they haven't remineralized it they're drinking sort of crappy um uh, sort of like sodas and stuff like that or diet cokes thinking it's um helping and just on that note all artificial sweeteners um, interfere with palm C and that's just a peptide that's tied into leptin but I think you probably come across this as well that even though um, sweetness contain no calories when it comes to calories in versus calories out there's so many faults to that equation it does work sort of in a sort of overall way and it doesn't it does have massive value but it's not the be all and end all so I think when you start to understand the sort of quantum side and that doesn't necessarily mean light it can mean clock genes in your body so we'll just use palm c and leptin as an example so if sweeteners are going to interfere with palm c and leptin that control your appetite and metabolism even if it doesn't have any calories it can still be a big barrier to your weight loss and i think that's where people can get confused they'll eat shitty food that is within their calorie range and then they're just getting bigger and bigger because they don't uh, understand either that food's information and it's basically crappy, traumatized food that's been made in a factory. And there's huge amounts of sort of science that's gone into um, junk food. It's a very clever industry. And, it, and they know everything about um, dopamine. They know everything about uh, all of these hacks and things in our brains. Even if mainstream science wants to ignore important studies, they snap them up. And then, it, uh, like I say to people, I don't want to be controlled by a packet of Monster Munch or a chocolate bar or an ice cream because it, it's not even alive. Um, how, what hope have I got against AI? And again, I think that's when I've tried to explain to people, you know, about the junk food thing, that it's giving you information, sort of quantum information, but it's the information it's giving you is just eat more and more and more of me. Um, rather than getting information from proper food, say gra a grass-fed and, and kindly reared animal, on a quantum level, the information that comes through that is sort of less traumatized food. So that's kind of digressed a bit out of the sort of more conventional biology and thinking about food in a different way, as in how is it treated before I ate it and how is that going to then impact you know, my appetite, my behavior um, based on the information carried in the food. Then back to understanding light again, w with dopamine, um, we, UVA light basically makes our dopamine around the UVA rise. It, and the UVA rise, it makes other things like serotonin and encephalins and melanin and, and all sorts. But when it comes to exercise and working out, people associate dopamine with just addictions or mood or um, motivation, but they forget that dopamine is really important for movement. So say in a gym, first of all, if you're low on dopamine because you've been on your phone all day and you're on your phone in the gym and there's blue light in the gym, your dopamine is going to get sucked. And first of all, you're probably not going to move as well as you could. So injury is more likely, but it's just really boring and not enjoyable. And people are just constantly looking at the clock or right, I'm meant to be here for an hour. This is boring. I can't wait to leave. Oh, I know I must look at a cat video. So, you, you know, there's that aspect of light as well. And once you, you know that tech companies knew decades ago about this blue light in screens, that's why it's there, because they want you to interact with them. <laughs> then it, it can kind of change how people behave in the gym and maybe completely put their phone away and switch into airplane mode and just leave it alone for the hour or be more willing to open the windows or even obviously training outside the best. But I think, again, fundamentally for sort of high performance athletes, any deficit in dopamine or something that might worsen their performance by one or two percent, they're interested. So, so for sort of high level athletes, if you can 
give them, say, a better light environment to train in, and they're going to get a one or two percent improvement because they're already elite anyway. So their trainers, their money, their minds are basically looking who can give me one or two percent extra performance because that's the difference between coming first or coming last. And then for the regular person that wants to exercise, it, the more dopamine you've got, the more you're going to enjoy your workout, the more you're going to want to do it again, the more you, the quicker you're going to advance, the better you're going to move, the less distracted you're going to be in your workout. Because I was talking to you earlier about how when I started going to the gym in my 20s, there was no phones and different lighting and people just used to work out. Okay, we'd chat a little bit, but most of the time people were banging it out and people just looked better in the gym. Whereas I haven't been to my gym for ages because I've been away and every single person in there just looks exactly the same. And, and it's like, you know, you're, you're like we were talking about, I always have specific goals. I want to get better at something, learn a new movement, change body composition. Whereas these people just look the same and they are still on their phones all the time. And again, you probably, most people know that when I used to go to the gym, you couldn't buy any food in it. There was nothing. Whereas now there's just vending machines all over the room full of, mm -hmm. you know, grenade bars or weird and wonderful sort of pre-workouts. And I'm just thinking I'm like nearly 47 and I can just go in and bang it out. A 20-year-old, why do they need a pre-workout? It's like, is that something you use? Because again, I think it's the dopamine problem. They haven't got enough of their own neurochemicals because they've depleted them with bad lighting or they can't be bothered to see the sunrise they can't be bothered to go out in the uv light and make their own so they need all of these crazy unusual compounds to just do a workout like in their 20s yeah i must admit i used to be on that path myself you know um when i first started training there's a product called jack 3d that come out oh and it yes was, uh, i used that it's now. <laughs> yeah. dimethyl amyl amylene or something like that you know all these stimulant like compounds they start to make copies of it but with a slight little change here and there um i did use those things and to be honest you know diminishing returns i didn't leave the gym feeling good i didn't enjoy my workouts it's more like i was forcing myself i had to use more and more of the same dose or the same product sorry to get to get more out of it um i'm much more different now my mindset towards using these sort of things um, i use a few little amino acids as like biohacks here and there they seem to be helpful, um, as in I've used it, not used it, and measured the difference. Um, so I'm talking about things like citrulline, taurine, you know, creatine, obviously, from red meat. Um, it seems to be quite helpful. But I was kind of curious as well, like you're talking about the gym quite a lot and people, you know, trying to eke out the extra 1% here and there. Do you think there's any supplements, peptides, things you can put in your body, basically, that are useful for people that exercise or looking for a performance benefit? I, I, the thing is, I'll answer that after I've sort of said the rest, because I think nowadays mm. if people are not, if their circadian rhythm is not right, I think it's a very foolish idea to put um, compounds in that, because like, yeah, of course, growth hormones are brilliant um, compound, but it's it's a time a, a crystal or time hormone of its own. If there's something wrong with your body clocks, I, mm. I think that could go nasty. It's the same with things like bioidenticals. If you've got loads of deuterium in you already, and which push you, pushes you in an unwanted growth phase, and your body clocks are crap, if you started to put something like growth hormone in, it, that's why the data on IGF and growth hormone, some says it causes cancer, some says it doesn't, because you don't know that the, the circadian rhythms of the people that you put it on, but put that in. Mm. So, yeah, that's the thing with, with with hormones that we make anyway, that we take extra of. There's no doubt that they can increase lots of things that people want in the gym. But on the other hand, you're playing with a two-edged sword with those kind of compounds. Because you're going to, anything that you, you know, if you can make it and then you take it, you're going to shut down your own production. And that's the same with melatonin. Yeah, there's plenty of melatonin supplements around, but we can make it ourselves. So, so that's a really interesting topic because I think supplements or nutrition to feel better is something totally different to performance enhancement because for, for some people, it depends on what the barrier is. Because if it's mental in the gym, yes, of course, there are loads of nootropics and things that people could take, especially if they've got real ADHD, which is something like 20 percent of the population if it can make them concentrate and focus on, on something, their work or, or a workout and nothing else can, obviously it's going to be life changing because they're just, they can't do it otherwise. Whereas when it comes mm. to 
just wanting to say look like Rich Piana or um, Arnold in the day that that's that that's different. But for the everyday person, yeah, sure, you know there are things for healing healing injuries, but it's also understanding why did you get injured in the first place? Is, is it because your technique's bad? Is it because you, there's horrible lighting in the gym? Because when you work out, your mitochondria need red light, and when you move, they actually make melatonin during the daytime. So it's not for us to sleep; it's for them to repair themselves mm. as we're working out. Because exercise is intrinsically a big, massive stressor, uh, and we're breaking things as we're doing it. And movement is intrinsically painful for the body. We've got loads of neurological blocks in there to make sure that we don't notice. But the mitochondria need this melatonin uh, to repair themselves as we're actually exercising. And if you don't have any near infrared, particularly because that's blocked by glass, you're basically working out and your mitochondria are vulnerable. And you obviously won't notice because that's the other thing about mitochondria and quantum physics. It's all invisible. Uh, so it's not just the blue light in the gym. It's the fact there's no UV because of the glass and there's no infrared to protect the mitochondria. So sometimes it's working out why these people, why can't they build muscle in the first place? Is it what they're eating? Are they not sleeping? What's the gym environment like? how much non-native EMFs are there because that's terrible for, it basically kicks the, um, the, the coppers off the bone and the bo our bone is a semiconductor uh, and the LED. So again, the, there are other forces at play in gyms that weaken structures because again, a bone is a target for an injury as are ligaments. And that's where we start to get into collagen and glyphosate and, fl and fluoride, which can mm -hmm. cause problems in, in ligaments. So sometimes I want to go back sort of to the quantum stuff. It might be really boring for the person or the client because they want the peptide or the, the hormone, but Sometimes it's better to make the, the foundation better. And sometimes the problems go away and the person does, is not interested in the peptide anymore. But then, Or you can make like a platform of somebody that's got a good circadian rhythm, understanding light, sleeping properly, drinking proper water, eating proper food. And they still, yeah, you know, I'm really curious about all these things. And I would say that's a safer environment to start adding supplements and things in because supplements have all got side effects and whatever you add into the body for every action there's an opposite reaction uh, and the better you are constitutionally or the better your redox the better you can deal with these because your liver still has to detox all of these unusual compounds whether it's a medicinal mushroom or cbd or testosterone or some, or anavar or psalms or, or peptides so mm -hmm. again it's making sure that your body can actually deal with all of these um sort of exogenous performance boosters and i think like you know you probably have come across people who use these boost these muscle growth products when their body say young men in their 20s their skeletons don't have the capacity to take humongous load you know i'm just talking you know like 250 kilo deadlifts and 200 kilo squats their skeleton doesn't have the capacity and also their tendons don't have the capacity so i've seen some really nasty bone problems in people who've their, their muscles can do it their brains can do it but their their ligaments and their bones are not ready to take that massive load whereas sort of strong men in the past would have started training as a teenager and gradually sort of loaded up and up and up. Yeah, of course, some of them will have used, st used stuff at some points, but they didn't just want it all in six months uh, like some people do. Yeah, it certainly does take time. I appreciate your comments about setting the foundation right before you sort of add any of these things in. Um, now, a lot of people kind of think they're in a position where they can optimize, get the extra 1%, but they're missing the pillars that you've just mentioned. So, you know, a sensible, non-processed food diet, appropriate sleep, the right light exposure. Um, do you find that there's people, or do you find there's many objections that people have to applying some of the things that you recommend? So getting the, you know, the distilled water, remineralized water, things like that. Are there many things you think, well, oh, people just can't do this or they struggle to do this? And how do you approach them? Oh, no, I'm completely, uh, in my old age, I've got much ruder and more direct. And I've just said to people, do you want to drink 40,000 chemicals? Do you want to drink other people's birth control as a male? Do you want other people's antidepressants? Do you want all the other things that unscrupulous companies have just dumped in the sea and the rivers? Do you want to drink a load of fluoride that's going to drain your energy, mess up your 
um, your thyroid, it, it's like 150 pounds or 200 dollars to buy a distiller, a carbon filter. It's not the best on the market. You know, you can get better, but I have this grading thing of some things are acceptable and good, and then there's certain products that are excellent. And just moving from poor, as in drinking just tap water, up to good or good using a distiller and remineralizing it is a massive game changer and, and somebody would have to be completely dumb to be, say to me oh that's nonsense i want to drink forty thousand chemicals and the other thing about water is with the structuring some people initially tell me it's woo woo if you, you know you want to structure the water with light or put it outside or vortex it but naturally w water that our ancestors drank it wasn't sort of traumatized water they just got it out of rivers or wells and it'd been in the sunshine it'd been down the well where, where it's more magnetic nowadays with water systems we've got pipes and processing plants where the water gets squished through um, different pipes crashed around um, pushed through this squashed uh, stuff gets added to it so all we're doing by structuring and remineralizing and cleaning it is just putting it back to how it should be it's not some magic kind of thing that i've invented it's just with modern water processing it's just been made to be incoherent lacking in energy and full of like chemicals so take the chemicals out then you've got naked water of reverse osmosis works as well then put minerals back in because they're cheap easy everybody agrees that minerals are important you can make your own blends you can put whatever you like in even just barge gold salt and some potassium citrate and a bit of magnesium or you can get more creative depending on what takes your fancy and it tastes delicious and it's back to this thing of people wanting treats and overeating my water that i make is absolutely delicious and i can't wait to drink it uh, so to me it's sort of really joyful and again a lot of people are mineral deficient and then their bodies are just going to go and search for anything that's got some kind of mineral in it and just overeat that and i just think it, it's not expensive and if you explain to people it's not you know um like quackadoodlery it, you, you're just putting water back to how it would have been for our ancestors and, and tell them that the water in the rivers and the wells etc was in the sunshine they're like oh yeah i see and also it's not very expensive and it's you put the water in the distiller press a button go away and come back in an hour and it's ready so it doesn't require a lot of effort that's interesting you say that yeah that's something i've i've heard bits and pieces about but if I'm honest, I'm still trying to catch up about the light stuff, watching Jack Cruz talk about a lot of that. Um, so I probably need to catch up a bit on um, all the water stuff. Um, yeah, we did I actually the... sell these these Sorry, bottles, and they're meant to have structured water. Once you put it in, it structured the water for you. Is there anything to that, or is that... Uh, the thing is, somebody asked me this yesterday cause in my membership group, and the, water, the bottle was plastic, so I straight away poo-pooed it. Because uh, the thing is, no matter what, there's all truth in this, because if you can structure water into the fourth phase, which sunlight will do and magnetism does, it makes a hexagon, and each hexagon pops out an electron. And then the more electrons we have, the more energy we, we have if we go out in the sun and charge them. But, but what these companies forget to tell you is you just need your own glass jar. So, you, you know, yes, you know, it might look nice, but if it's in plastic um, with a lid on it, how can the full spectrum of light get through? That's why if I ever do my water, I have, the, have a jar and the, the top's off so the light can get in the top. And, yeah, m maybe there's like a placebo thing, but if it's made of plastic, then I'm like, no, I'm not interested, sorry. But yes, there, yeah. are, there are certain other devices. There's like a copper sort of toroidal, right-hand toroidal coil that's been around for probably 80 years. And it's got loads of research behind it that you can um, bring, you can flow your water around and it'll act like a sort of vortex. And it's really cheap. And I totally buy into that because there's research and I understand how that would work. But it's, it, it's, it's not expensive and it's not complicated. You just put it in, whereas no matter what there is that's trending like the problem with quantum biology is there's plenty of room for snake oiling and quackadoodlery because th these websites and these sales pages will say oh yeah there's 42 patents and 120 pages of papers of research it's like yes but they're not yours but you've pretended they belong to your product and yes dr pollock has got loads of research on water so there's lots of research on carbon dioxide hydrogen so these companies will just take this research put it on a flashy web page and it's not actually directly related to that product it's related to water and energy so that's where you have to be a bit careful 
Uh, so I always read those and, and I find, and I'll email them and obviously they ignore me because I've caught them out. So uh, th that's what I think about things like that. And normally with a good product, or something like, you know, a spurty lamp, the vitamin B lamp's quite useful. It's got the terrible website and you never see Facebook ads for it. And, you know, really simple sort of things that have been around for ages that actually do work. Uh, it's a really good product, but they're just not very good at marketing. Whereas the shitty products, somebody else has really helped the marketing. So again, it's playing with our psychology and, you know, yes, there is truth in it, you know, but like lots of people say, half a truth turns into a massive lie but, but i don't want people to think just because these companies are, are, are pu like pulling your leg it doesn't mean the rest of it's correct it is correct but you can do it yourself with just things in the house so that that's my thought on it so i'd never buy any of these gizmos oh, i see yeah a lot of these things sometimes it's hard to really know what you're doing you know you have to watch so many hours of videos um like what kind of what resources would you personally look at? I know you've quoted a few people that um you you found research from, but where would you where would you start with all this if you want to know for yourself? I think um I know some people find Dr. Cruz hard to listen to, but that particular podcast, the three podcasts he did with Max Dr. Max Gil Hain, mm. I've sent loads of people who know nothing, and they've really enjoyed those three, and they've really understood it. And because sometimes, you know, he can just be too difficult to understand or he doesn't want to break things down. But I found in those three podcasts, that's a really good introduction to light and leptin and water and magnetism. And anybody can understand. I've sent so many different people with different levels of intelligence and understanding and they all got it. Uh, and, and also when he talks to Max, he wasn't in a, on a rampage. He was really in a good mood for, for, for teaching. Dr. Pollock's book, The Fourth Phase of Water, that sort of explains to you about the structured water and about water having energy, about us having a, a water battery in our bodies, how red light and grounding are really important for our exclusion zone water in a very simple way. I mean, Dr. Cruz is very good at sort of making boring things interesting, whereas Dr. Pollock's book is so simple and it's very well referenced. and He never speculates or makes things up. So, so that's a good, a good resource. And um, when it comes to magnetism, that's something that people find more difficult to understand. And, and there's a lot of that. Magnetism is much more, um, much easier for quackadoodlery to try and blind people with science. So I just tend to say to people with magnetism, if you think about the earth being a magnetic lump and you can stand on it and the closer you are to it, the better. And remember tech is electromagnetic fields and anything that spins in an electromagnetic field is going to make an alien sort of frequency for you. So be careful of hair dryers, your phone and spinning fans and stuff like that. Just just be mindful and also turn off your devices when you don't need them. And that's enough for sort of a lay person without overcomplicating anything. Because obviously elect electricity and magnetism uh, are, are intimately tied together. And that's how I leave it for, for, for people who, who, who aren't sure, because that's the thing that people take the longest to understand is the magnetism, whereas the light is pretty easy to understand. Because, I mean, Andrew Huberman talks a lot about light and sunrises and stuff like that. And then with the water, people have been talking about that for a long time. Uh, Harold Tears, the, um, the guy who invented the cosmic tower, is really good at talking about water. But then the rest of the cosmic tower can be okay what 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 have i just listened to but his lessons on water are, he's actually better at explaining water than dr pollock but dr pollock's got sort of plenty of decades of experience explaining water to people um so i think it just depends how deep somebody wants to go because i always kind of want to explain to people how it works but not, not over complicate it but keep it correct from, from a physics perspective because yes you could go into Einstein and, and get super confused but then always bring it back to how can they apply it to, to, to their life because that's fundamentally what people want to do and that, that's all they're interested in really but they also want some validation that's correct that's why I tend to like to break things down into hydrogen deuterium and electrons for people and explain it that way and, and then just keep keep, keep it simple um 
But there's a there's for the body electric side. There's um, the, the book, the body electric. But a lot of people have come across that already, and most people are perfectly accepting that we're an electric being. It's the water that can be a bit confusing for some people, and the light. There's so much research now about bad lighting and circadian rhythms, and most people who've tried red light think, "Oh, I like this." So they're kind of more open to, to considering that. And most people know they feel better when they go on holiday and it's sunny or they go outside and people don't like it when it's cloudy. So mm. they kind of know it probably is important. It's just, they, it's never dawned on them. You know, when something's right in front of your nose, you miss it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see that a lot of people, you know, people go on holiday, you don't go on a holiday to have a bad time. Um, <laughs> yeah. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? You know, um, I've got some questions as well about like maybe just some key key points. So someone, you know, like me, maybe doesn't know much about all this sort of stuff. They want to build a great physique and train hard in the gym, do, have a bit of fun, you know. What what kind of hacks are they going to deploy? So obviously things like the grounding, the appropriate light exposure. What, what else is there, like in a, in a nutshell? Obviously correct hydration. And I don't mean just using like chemical electrolytes. Like I said, make your own proper water and that'll make a massive difference. And then or also, I think, like you said, the bottleneck is the rest and relaxation. So just something simple of seeing the sunrise every day, because that's going to set your hormone cascade off properly. And hormones do drive metabolism and body composition then see the UV light. So that would be, you know, even just a half an hour walk or drive to the gym with a window open so you've got enough dopamine for your workout. And then block the blue lights after sunset because you don't want a load of blue lights, especially after 12 p.m. because that's when estrogen is, that's sort of estrogen's time. So we don't want loads of blue light in the afternoon because we can become estrogen dominant. But it's much worse if you don't block any blue light in the evening because it's, it's going to now um, degrade your melatonin. So when you sleep, you, you, you haven't got enough melatonin for sleeping. So some people go to sleep, but they don't make enough melatonin. So all of the repair to your mitochondria doesn't happen. The autophagy and the apoptosis doesn't happen. If you are not getting in bed until 1 p.m., you've missed the growth hormone window because it'll come out from about 9 p.m. up until 12 a.m. by itself if you're already in bed. Um, so, so that's kind of the very basic fundamentals that pretty much everybody can do. Obviously, there are problems to do with it being dark for ages in the morning and dark early. But mm. using the cold is something really important that we need to do in the northern hemispheres. Because first of all, for insulin resistance and leptin resistance, the cold is an excellent way to start to reverse those. So our brown adipose tissue, the brown fat, that's nature's answer to diabetes. And also for body composition, cold plunges or swimming in cold water or um, putting ice in your bath. Sometimes you don't need that when it's minus five here and getting in it for a significant amount of time is going to burn fat. And also it's burning fat and it's making the mitochondria work in a way that's different to exercise because they uh, use energy and use up body fat, but they do it in a less inflammatory way. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with exercise. I'm just saying that sometimes if somebody's primary goal is fat loss, using uh, cold therapy is probably a better option for them because it's uncomfortable, but also um, cold it inhibits inflammation so you wouldn't do it after a workout but you would do it mm. say on a rest day because you can optimize sort of your goal you can reduce the inflammation later because you obviously need inflammation for muscle to grow then you want it to go away um, because it's going to interfere with sort of fat loss so i would say using cold is really important for athletes as well because if you get really cold adapted this can take about 18 months it massively improves cardiac function and vo2 max and if you, if you really to go to town with it, it's almost like having two hearts and three lungs. So this is back to the professional athletes looking for something that it requires effort, but you know you can't get drug tested for cold thermogenesis and being cold adapted. So, and no matter what you asked about compounds before, no matter what we invent, it gets banned. So again, using the cold, and even if people can't do cold plunges, just going outside when it's really cold for a walk, 
and coming back in, that's going to really get your mitochondria ramped up. It's going to help with your insulin resistance if that's your problem or your blood sugar. And it just makes common, it's common sense thermodynamically that if you cool a human down, it's got to use energy again to heat itself back up again. And, and a bit like HIT, for some people, cold can really help them with their thyroid function because the thyroid's got to get going if you get cold, same as um, using HIT, which I do for people who've got sort of thyroid issues for all different reasons. It's initially stressful, but then you take away the stress and it's just a gentle way to start to boost. Because I think in terms of athletes, particularly women, hormones are more of a problem. They're, they're less robust than a male. and It tends to be the progesterone and, and the thyroid that it gets hit first in females, whereas men, yes, testosterone is sensitive, but they're not as sensitive globally with their hormone disruption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. I mean, I, I'm not a fan of um, cold showers myself. I, I did have cold showers and baths for about a month straight. The coldest setting it would go, I'd just go in there for as long as I could pretty much, so probably 10, 15 minutes. Um, what I did notice was quickly after a week, I stopped getting that, I don't know, like, high after doing it. It's almost as if I got used to it. And I was like, well, how am I going to get this colder? Um, but I'll, what I will say is I think part of that is due to the fact that I've always slept with a cold room. Um, I always have the window open. Even right now, the window's open. Um, it is cold in my house right now, but I'm just very much used to it. So do you think there's still a benefit of using that kind of intervention to someone that is otherwise what you might call cold adapted? Oh, definitely. Because first of all, that when you transfer heat through water, it's a much better transfer of heat and cold by, I think, something like, I think maybe tenfold. So when you have a cold shower, or so, I don't turn my heating on very much. It's the medium of air. Whereas if you actually do cold immersion, that's a whole other level because you're transferring the cold uh, much more aggressively and, and much deeper. And again, I would say cold thermogenesis, if we're talking about cold plunges, people start sort of in the 55 to 50 Fahrenheit. So that sort of would be around sort of 18, 20 ish degrees, which is still cold enough. And that would count as sort of cold, cold swimming outside in the UK maybe in the spring but then if you want to get into deep ct that's when you sort of go below 10 degrees c or below you sort of you go into the 40s and maybe even the 30s so that sort of translates to cold swimming or outdoor swimming in the winter without a wetsuit so it's basically like you said that the shower it is going to be beneficial because you're getting coldness on your brown fat which is up here and and in your back and, you, and when we get exposed to the cold, we, it also produces neurotransmitters. So we get a noradrenaline boost, an oxytocin boost, and a dopamine boost. But, but as we know with biology, that if you keep pressing a button, it sensitizes. So you need to find a little bit more. So generally, getting into actually cold baths and ice is the next level from a shower. So you'll get the high again. But then the other thing I found it, find is I prefer to actually swim in something because I'm doing something, as in I've got to swim around the lake however many times. Because this last yeah. summer I did a, um, a 5K swim outside in a lake in Scotland and it was just, okay, I'm going to do this and there's two, three weeks to get ready. I haven't really swum that much outside. So, so that was sort of, um, I was doing something. I had a goal. I was outside. I was with the swans. I was getting UV light. And I think like I said, with any exercise, fundamentally you want to really enjoy it as well. The same with cold thermogenesis, that some people like listening to podcasts when they're freezing. Some people, like I do this sometimes, it's a very good way to make you overcome something that's difficult. Like you can sit in the cold and just deal with it, but also think about something that's a problem for you and mentally find a way over that. The other benefit of cold is it can be really helpful for people with addictions. It doesn't matter if they get addicted to cold thermogenesis. It's better than what it was before. And I've had everything from food to porn to, you know, drugs to alcohol. You know, I don't judge any addiction. And, and with those kind of people, plugging them into either exercise and cold really helps them and sometimes both they'll just gobble up both and i think well there's a lot worse things you could be addicted to and now i've moved you into something that gives you dopamine and pleasure and you can have a mental battle with the ice cold bath or, or, or the um the squat rack rather than having a mental battle with yourself over over, addic over addictions so, so that's where i think 
of all the quantum stuff, cold is the mis- most misunderstood because the those in the know will try and tell you, oh yeah, don't catch cold because it's bad for you. Don't go outside because it's cold. Turn up your heating. And it's like, actually, it's the complete opposite. Like you said, people can become sort of air, kind of cold adapted over time by just opening their windows at home and just t- and turn the heating down. Because it's just common sense that, you know, your body's going to have to keep you warm. And it's not a good idea to be just a warm adapted mammal. We're be- meant to be both cold and warm adapted. Mm. Yeah, I understand that. I, I'm going to play devil's advocate now. Um, just because I've had a few people ask me about this and I've seen different opinions on it and it's in relation to cold exposure. Now, what they usually say is, you know, being cold is a stressor, you know, noradrenaline goes up, cortisol goes up, all this sort of stuff. Um, Is that necessarily a bad thing or does it have an overwhelmingly, you know, positive benefit from doing it? You know, like people always, you know, complain, oh, it's stressful, it's bad for the body. Um, When is it hormetic stress versus an an adaptive stress? Okay, so that's a really good point, because in terms of how we work physiologically, bursts of stress are are good for us. Otherwise, if we never have any stress, we get problems. So the biggest stressor of of constant cortisol is just artificial light, because that's going to have it up all day. Or working in an office with people you can't stand, that's going to put your cortisol up all day. Whereas if you expose yourself to, say, exercise or sauna or cold, you're going to get a bit stressed out for however long you did that for whether it's a a 20 minute sauna or an ice bath and then your cortisol and everything will go up but then it'll come back down again and it'll and, and it'll probably drop a bit lower than before so it's a bit like vagal tone that your ability to recover from a stress quickly is really important for your survival because like same as you like things happen to me all day and i'll explode but then i'll just come back down really quickly so it's like the vagal tone thing you're sort of training your body to respond to a stress but then teaching it to go back to normal quickly because that's just how it would have been with our ancestors we had bursts of stress and then then we went back to normal so it's these pulses are okay as long as they're not too long or too frequent like if people are doing a cold plunge for half an hour at one degree C and then for five hours afterwards they're shivering and have got anxiety. Well, that's not the cold plunge's fault. It's you just did it too cold and you're not ready. Same as you wouldn't just do a CrossFit workout if you'd never worked out in your life before. So it's just a common sense thing. And also there's so many different temperatures and times you can do cold therapy. You just pick something that's stressful for you then you come out, you'll shiver a bit, and then you'll feel good. And then you gradually work from there. So that's my view on stress. So yeah, of course, I think stress is is dangerous and unhealthy, but it's chronic stress versus bursts of stress, because you can actually build resilience by exposing yourself properly to her- hermetic stresses. And there's loads of them, like carbon dioxide breathing is a hermetic stressor for six minutes, but it teaches you how to tolerate sort of high carbon dioxide, say in a room full of people or in a car or in your bedroom at night. So it's all back to um, not being afraid of cortisol because, yeah, people get, oh, no, it's so bad. I must never raise it. It's like, well, if you never raise it, then you're going to have other problems as well. And it's all about not trying to do what Wim Hof does or Joe Rogan. Just work out what's going to be cold thermogenesis and a bit stressful for you. Start there. Like you said, when you stop getting a buzz or a benefit, or it's too easy, make it colder or do it for longer. Mm. Um, and again, I think the biggest enemy of like like cortisol, it, it, it's a blue light, and people being in an environment they hate, whether it's their job or or you know they're in the wrong relationship, that's far more of a cortisol stressor than than the cold plunge. In fact, a cold plunge can help people build resilience to th- these. Uh, like chronic stresses that they have i see yeah i I understand that makes more sense now because i was trying to look at it for a different lens because i'm you know you always hear contradicting opinions um but it's nice to hear someone else's take on it because from what i've been hearing it's just oh it's it's bad for you you know you don't enjoy it's bad it's bad it's bad but now you've mentioned the way it's the significance of the acute exposure versus the chronic exposure that's that makes much more sense to me 
But um, also, it's like everything. Everything's a protocol. Like even a way of eating, it's like there's a, a million different carnivore diets based on everybody's. You know, it's like you can't just say all cold plunges are bad because I've got no idea what the temperature was, and maybe somebody just did it on a stupid time of their menstrual cycle, or they, ju- you know, they did it just before bed and couldn't sleep, or they bought a cold plunge and made it make ice, and they've never been cold ever in their life. So, yeah, and also I know full well who you mean because uh, the said person also says it makes you fatter. Um, but then... The, uh, yeah, it Andrew doesn't make Huberman, you fatter. Yeah, uh, Andrew Huberman, no. w- within a few days, and um, I knew about this study anyway. There's a really good study on cold thermogenesis in army barracks. So when you think about studies, when you've got a laboratory, it's full of blue light and r- rats that are all clones. So we have to disregard those. Whereas if you've got human beings who go outside in an army barracks and when we've got say an army they all eat the same they all train the same they all live in the same environment so it was basically just um bed one no cold thermogenesis bed two cold thermogenesis so it was probably one of the best and tightest human studies on something the best we can do nowadays and it was categorically saying that all of the ones in the cold thermogenesis group showed many many benefits and and you can't pull that study apart you can't say oh it was rats oh you just got members of the public off the street and they could all be different or they were all similar age all male all at the same so i think those kind of studies and there are other ones as well it's not a brand new thing the cold plunging it kind of you know it's common sense to do it we've done it for thousands of years but also there's extremely strong scientific data that's very difficult to disagree with um in favor of it so i think it's again people shouldn't just run away from everything because it might raise cortisol because you know without cortisol we die it's like insulin people think it's a monster whereas okay fine mm. have more insulin then and you'll die same as cortisol they just don't understand how to play the game and they don't understand that cortisol is humongously light regulated so if they really want to get control of their cortisol they need to learn how to use light and dark for controlling it uh, rather than running away from anything that might raise it for 10 minutes i see yeah that kind of like what bart case is about exercise you know he's not saying to people you know do 10 hours of exercise a week he said you know train hard but do 30 40 minute session you know one to four times per week depending on what you're where you're at at that point in time and that makes sense to me um then if you say to someone go to the gym and do what i do yeah that would wreck them um, they, they haven't adapted. They haven't given the time of day needed to sort of get to that point. So yeah, that actually brings me to my next question, which is um, about like current or future research in, in this kind of field. Um, is there anything that seems to stand out to you in particular um, that might be existing in the near future? What's really important, so it's basically biophotonics because inside our body, like I mentioned, bones can make red light, but then there's a a, a giant show of ultraviolet signaling inside the body along with every colour of light. We've got sort of melanopsin receptors that are blue light receivers and we've got red light receptors and UV receptors inside the mitochondria. So fundamentally, we don't have the detection technology to, to, to make proper studies yet about how light actually drives hormonal pathways, how Dr. Robert O'Becker showed how it, light heals bone in very low frequencies. Then the other area which is actually relevant to me is magnetism, because Dr. Dean Bonnelly has passed away now, but the uh, Magnetico company, his daughter, um, has approached me to say maybe in the future if we, you'd like to be a spokesperson for Mag- Magnetico. But when I first learned about Dr. Dean Bonnelly, I thought, hang on a minute, this person's passed away, but he's got loads of studies that he hasn't finished. And, and, but she has worked with him. So again, magnetism is something I'd like to study or even personally or somebody else to pick up because the Earth has only got 90, it's lost 90% of its magnetic field because it used to be about five gauss now it's 0.5 so that's obviously a problem but people just ignore that so studying biomagnetism properly in a way that can be therapeutic the other thing is deuterium because that's sort of an isotope of hydrogen that um processed food companies don't want us to know about uh, that damages mitochondria if it's in excess it messes up our hormones and steals our energy 
um, and deuteronomics is growing. That's Dr. Borosh and Dr. Gabor Shomali's area. There are other people studying deuteronomics like Stephanie Seneff. But I think, again, Dr. Um, Gabor was telling me they applied for funding from the EU to use deuterium depleted water as a non-toxic, um, safe uh, therapy to aid with cancer that, that's affordable and the EU said no they'd rather fund sort of poisonous toxic um, chemo chemotherapy so, so there's a lot of barriers at, at actually researching quantum physics because y yes it, it's something that we've known about since sort of Einstein's time and we, if without quantum physics we wouldn't have iPhones or, 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 or lasers or NMR machines but still the idea of quantum biology is kind of new because originally people thought that quantum phenomena couldn't happen in the human body because it's too warm and wet but, but it does like photosynthesis is an example of um, quantum phenomena the way the electrons go down the electron transport chain you know how do they do that because there's stuff in the way and they basically have to travel through matter which quantum particles can me and you can't go through a wall but the particles within us can behave like this and then deuterium on a quantum level can actually be in more than one place at exactly the same time quantum superposition so wh when it comes to studying quantum physics everything is not how we thought it was on the macro level or the Newtonian level. So it requires a whole paradigm shift and accepting, okay, I was wrong. And that's why scientists can't stand that. They just want to carry on peddling even Rene Descartes' idea that we're all just a machine <laughs> and that's all we are. That was sort of like 17th or 18th century. So it, the barrier is that a lot of people have to say, well, actually, I'm really sorry. I was wrong about water. I was wrong about mitochondria they make water that's what's most important the ATP is secondary so I think the barriers to uh, working with quantum physics is first of all it can be quite difficult to detect electrons and very low levels of light but also it means that a lot of people are going to have to say oops I got it all wrong um, and also once you if, if everybody knew about deuterium because when I tell people about it I say it's a heavy isotope of hydrogen it's in group one in the periodic table with sodium and potassium so therefore it's a heavy metal the public knows what a heavy metal is and they don't like it they're scared of it if they all knew there was deuterium in their processed food and their grains and their tropical fruit that there'd be uproar so again that this idea of deuterium research or deuteronomics that wants to be stuffed under the carpet and i think again this all loops back to who funds the studies again things apple i think is like a two trillion dollar company by now and then facebook is something like nine nine hundred billion and then we've got food companies you'd probably know um i don't know how much kellogg's are worth or cadbury's or mcdonald's and, and they they have mm. the capacity to fund research and they do uh, so that's where the barriers are it's like it, it, you know quantum physics is invisible Plus, people want it want it to stay invisible because the public would be really annoyed if they actually knew what's been kept from from them. And it's not complicated at all. Like it's very easy to explain sort of basics of quantum physics to people. And once they get it, they won't like it when they know their food's full of deuterium and what's in their water. Yeah, I certainly look at food, nutrition, and things I do throughout a day in a different light nowadays. Um, I, I suffered with, just a personal anecdote, so I suffered with chronic fatigue since I was about 14. Um, it wasn't until about, so about the third year into my carnivore diet, so 20, I don't know, early 2023, I really started to notice a, a good benefit from actually doing it in terms of like my energy levels. And I attribute that, I think, to the deuterium depletion side of it. I really think that was, that was the key for me, then alongside obviously the appropriate light exposure, blue blocking, that sort of thing. Um, and I actually did an experiment myself, um, little N equals one. So I went to the gym, um, you know, bright blue lights, all that sort of stuff. I don't go there anymore. Um, I went to the gym, my heart rate was elevated. I left feeling crap. What I actually did was put, um, not quite your color tinge of blue blockers, but like a more of a yellow, slightly lower sort of nanometer frequency or wavelength, um, blocking ones. And my heart rate was much low when I trained, but I didn't train as hard. So it kind of told me there's obviously something to light. Um, if we're blocking out a lot of the blue light, we're reducing a lot of the excess stress, which is probably inappropriate, at least in the doses we seem to be getting. I mean, 
Does that match any of your kind of experience at all? What you found for oh, yourself? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you blocked out the blue, the blue light, because um, blue light in the absence of the rest of the spectrum is going to cause POM C to be broken down into ACTH and CLIP, and ACTH raises cortisol. So um, that would be something that if you blocked the the blue light, um, then you're going to just have less cortisol in a very simple language. That would make sense. Um, in terms of what we're talking about. But, but also back to the carnivore diet, it is like it depends on what you're eating before. Also, a keto and carnivore diet, when you eat predominantly fat and then some protein, uh, fat has got twice as many electrons as, as glucose and it's going to produce twice as much uh, metabolic deuterium depleted water in the mitochondria. And when you dehydrate foods and measure the deuterium, glucose or carbs are all 150 to 155. Seed oils are 200 and fat is 110 to 120. So even my mother can understand, okay, there's this thing called deuterium. I don't want mine to go over like 140. Oh, fat's not got very much in it and glucose has got lots. It's probably not a good idea to eat lots of glucose. Uh, and most people can grasp that concept. But just so people don't get terrified of deuterium, we've got two checkpoints in our mitochondria to check that it's you know, not trying to get into the mitochondria. But like any checkpoint or system in the body, if you overload it with deuterium, then it's going to break it. So, you know, we've got, our bodies are clever. You know, there's a lot, you know, as long as we don't overload them, they can deal with a lot, including heavy metals, if you've got good redox. So I think back to the carnivore diet, it's also simple as well um, for you to do. Because if somebody's got chronic fatigue and you try and get them to do a keto diet and count how many grams of fiber and how many... Mm. You know grams of protein it's like i can't it's not possible but if you say to somebody look just eat meat and fish and you know you can have eggs if you want butter that's fine just don't you know don't have anything else it's kind of enough to to, to for even somebody that's got terrible brain fog uh, um to be able to to manage so that, that's why i think it is really helpful for people but especially if they are stuck and they don't know what to do and but so many people have told them different diets if you just say look go carnivore just do it for 60 days don't like get scared about all the silly research about meat being dangerous and cholesterol because people you know eat mcdonald's every day for 10 years and they're fine you're not going to hurt yourself and it's going to be better than what you're eating already so just give it a go and see what happens so i think also there's lots of benefits in just keeping things really simple for people and sometimes just if you just say to people you know, you've taken out stuff that could have glyphosate, you know, with, with meat, yes, we've got much more control over buying meat, you know, that we know is not traumatized, whereas goodness knows what's been sprayed on even organic vegetables, even in the UK. And I think for somebody in a really bad state, I haven't got any issues with a lot of plants that, I have, but that I've grown in my garden, but I do distrust um, the industry just because I know how many loopholes there are. So I think it's just for simplicity's purpose for people, you know, just start somewhere, keep it simple and just do one thing, focus on the carnivore diet. And then, you know, if that's helping great, and then if you want to do more, then you can do your sort of circadian stuff. I tend to start with circadian and diet together just because I think it's so important to do the circadian stuff. And most people have already tried some kind of elimination diet or being vegan, which can be helpful if people really do eat crap and take it away. But then obviously it bites you massively in the bum in a few months. But, you know, people have made an effort to change their food, but often nobody's ever told them about light or grounding. And I don't think it's difficult to do those things at the same time as changing your way of eating. Yeah. I agree. I think I appreciate and um, love the value that you sort of have towards not being myopic, not saying, oh, it's just do this, just do, you know, slot all these things together. You know, the body's a biological adaptive organism. You can't just fix it by, you know, increasing your protein by this much. Look at the whole picture because you can get the most of the benefit and you can add and take these things out as you, as you see fit. You'll be able to see for yourself how much benefit each of those things kind of gives you. Um, and that kind of note, what would you say was probably the most important? So someone's to take away from this interview, one single thing, or maybe like a list of like hierarchy of like one, two, three, do this in this order. What would you say? 
make your bedroom sacred. So get the tech out. Don't charge your phone near your bed. Don't play with your phone in bed. And take it away at least two hours before bed. That's a massive one. And even people who are really health conscious and even people I've worked with who've got lots of problems still do that. And I'm like, look, you can get away with a lot in the daytime if you can sleep. If you mess up your sleep, then you've buggered it up and you're going to have to start again tomorrow. So that's like a really, like really protect your sleep and, and make an effort to make your bedroom um, sort of a sleep safe zone. And then I just think also just keep it really simple to start with, with food. Just don't eat anything that um, is don't eat traumatized food from a factory. I don't care if people eat carrots and potatoes. I don't care about the, I don't care about the nuts. At least it's a whole food. It's, it got grown. It's been picked. It's still what it's supposed. It looks like what it was when it was on a tree. Leave getting really obsessed about that for now. Just stop eating crap that isn't food. So, and you know, then later we can hone it in if, if it doesn't, if it's not working for you, but just don't eat things that factories have um, got their claws into. And that includes actually, I really have an issue with, with um, um, sort of homogenized and pasteurized dairy because it does all kinds of horrible things to calcium. And then I, you know, minerals are, are a favorite of mine. It does horrible things to proteins and makes them or all inflammatory and we don't need it however if you live next door to a farm with raw dairy that's still how it was when it came out of the cow P people haven't fiddled about with it and boiled it and dyed it and made it sit around in plastic for days so that, that's all that's all i say and, and it sounds really really simple but we work with people and even those things i've had people like still a year later, I'm like, why are you still eating white cabbage trays? Why are you still eating McDonald's? It's like, you know, it's not, it sounds easy to us, but then to other people, it's like, it can be really difficult. So that's where sometimes a little bit of patience on my behalf is required. So I would say, preserve your sleep. Um, don't eat things from a factory and see the sunrise. That, that, that's, that would be a good start for people. Because even if you mess up the rest of the day at least you started it properly and then we can work on the rest later and also if somebody's preserving their sleep that's automatically going to mean they have to block the artificial light in the evening so but that's where i just get people to start and, and, I, and I don't think that's a big ask what do you think what are your fundamentals? Yeah. just do this to humor me for 30 days for me for me um, the big one for me seems to be be the diet. Um, bear in mind, I come from a background of eating like a thousand grams of carbs a day. So that was obviously a massive switch for me in terms yeah. of what I was already doing. Um, for me, the second one would be the light exposure. Um, so that obviously it would incorporate the blue blocking glasses, turning off the screens, having a red light sort of lamp on or whatever, something like that. Um, the third one for me, probably, I would say exercise and or getting out in nature to some degree. Um, so being out outside, you know, physical activity outside would be my best case scenario. Yeah, that's, but that's the problem. We can't really quantify health like this because any kind of grounding is just normal. And also, as I mentioned anyway, the clean water. So I sometimes think there's, again, we can't condense it into three things because no matter what, we're going to leave out something really important because I'm the same as you. Just movement is man's best medicine and obviously gossip's woman's best. No, but it's kind of movement. Everybody has to move somehow. And I don't care. I I've got clients who are in wheelchairs. I've had people, all sorts of things that they can all do something uh, and i just think it's the body's a machine that's designed to move so i think it's really difficult to give people three things because also it depends on the person because some people are really good with their diet but they're terrible with their light and some people do all the quantum stuff and think oh well i'm out in the sun all day so i can just eat chocolate and smoke and you know get pissed because i'm out in the sun so i think it's i always look at um, everything I've got several things I look at different pillars and, and look for okay they're good here they're acceptable here they're poor here right that's the thing I need to help them with and for example somebody might be excellent with their diet and they want to say to me oh I want to start fasting I want to start you know eating only food I've grown myself and it's like well no you, you've done like really well here go and deal with your exercise that's not very good or go and deal with your water like if you're drinking tap water yet you're eating the most perfect diet ever you're insane so that's why I tend to look at because we've all got our own strengths and weaknesses and we're, we all tend towards different modalities so some people are really good at doing 
cold thermogenesis, but then they um, play on their phone in, in bed. And other people are really good at um, exercise and the quantum stuff. And then they like eat, like um, s- s- secret eating before bed. So I think it does come down to w- what are you good at? And that's brilliant. L- let's do more of where, so, and it's also the thing you want to do the least and dislike the most. That's the thing you need to do. Yeah, my, my worst one is um, well, up until yesterday when I deleted Facebook, social media at nine o'clock at night. Why do I need to be responding to people at nine o'clock at night? You know, it's, it's, an, it's a constant thing. I could put my phone down for a few hours. It wouldn't make a difference to me or anyone else. Uh, so that's something I I've, I've obviously need to work more on. Um, so that means oh, yeah. YouTube yeah, less, Instagram are. less. Yeah, the thing is, fundamentally for business, I do need to use um, social media. But the the thing that really annoys me is just people like DMing me or WhatsApping me. I've never met them in my life and they expect me to give them a one to one by DM at 10 p.m. when I'm about to go to bed. And it's like I'm more than happy. I share loads of free information. And also it it comes down to, you know, I don't with with free information. It's like my grandfather used to say free advice is worth what it's what you pay for it. Uh, And it's like. I would never in a million years even dream of like even probably DMing somebody something like that, let alone WhatsApping them. Uh, And it's just like that, what we know, and there's no way I'm answering that at sort of 8 p.m. because it's like just just stupid. Like obviously if it was something really important like my mum and dad, but then they live in Wales. What am I supposed to do about it like at 10 o'clock at night? So I definitely think it's the FOMO thing that... You know, we I managed for like 20 years. I There was no phones and it doesn't do any harm. And it's like lots of times I've done things like I've uh, lost my SIM card or broken my phone and not had it for a couple of days. And there's been nothing mm. in it that I've missed. And, y- you know, you kind of think it doesn't even matter. The whole world goes on without me. And it's not a FOMO thing. It's actually sort of a like a dopamine sucking porthole to, to, to keep us sort of interacting with mm. um with the blue light. So yeah, I think, I think also it's a part, like you say, the whole social media is like another planet and you could live in it if you wanted to. And that's the problem. And you think you're missing out, but you're not. Cause <laughs> yeah, I don't gain much from it. I don't get much from answering people's questions. And um, as long as you won't even get a thank you and it'll be whatever type. Once I got a question at, um, on Christmas day. So last year, year, year and a month ago, nearly, um, what do you think about fasting? It's Christmas Day. I'd rather you just enjoy your time with family. That's going to be much more important for your long-term health right now than asking a question about fasting. You know? Yeah, that's exactly the same as me. It's like, you know, poor Jonathan is just trying to enjoy his his private life with his family. Who the F are you to disturb his Christmas Day? And it's like, yeah, I had something similar of somebody saying to me, oh, it was like Christmas Eve or something, asking me how many milligrams of progesterone and testosterone. It's like, look, uh, hello, <laughs> have some respect for, for my time and, you know, don't invade my privacy. I'm more than happy to help you, even sometimes if I'm in a good mood for free, but don't you dare do it. You know, I have a life as well. And I, th- I think that's something that, you know... I like it annoys me, but I can not. I can avoid that by just not having the phone on. So if they do that, well, I won't know because the phone's off, and I can't get angry at them because I won't know. So, and then I can deal with it the next day or just scroll on by. Um, mm. So yes, that, that is a on, that, that's a on terrible that note. Like bothering you on Christmas Day. Yeah, you should have I mean, on... say, well, I, think, I think fasting is really important. I think the most important thing is to fast on Christmas Day. So I forbid you to eat anything else today. So you must fast from this message onwards. That's why I probably, I don't know what I would have done. I would have exploded for certain. I think I replied and I helped him out. I spent half an hour of my Christmas Day to answer the question, but that wasn't that's my, I've learned better now. Um, yeah, the thing is, you know. that doesn't surprise me with you because you're a really generous man and I've got lots of friends who are super generous. But then you get, you get to a point one day you think, why am I killing myself with my phone for some sort of person that's just totally taken the piss and will probably take absolutely zero notice of what I've just said anyway and go and ask about 20 other people the same question until somebody gives them the answer they want. They want. And then they won't do mm. anything anyway. So, you know, ask holding. <laughs> I think we have the... You know. Yeah, I think I think on that note, what I will say is um, I'll put all of your links below and I'll also put a link yeah. to your, I believe you've got a really good informative ebook out or a infographic. Um, so obviously your socials, your 
YouTube channel, everything will be linked below. Um, is there anything else that people should be made aware of that is content services, packages oh, yeah. of yours? Yeah, I've got a, um, a monthly membership group where people can ask questions 24-7. We have a, a live, uh, two lives a week. And then the thing you're referring to is the 10-step quantum kickstart. So it's just a free PDF and it's a list of things to do. And people love lists <laughs> and w what you should be doing and why and how it can help you. And then I have like my minerals course and I've got a new quantum course coming out. I've got a basic one for people who want to get into it. And then I've got a more in-depth one of, of how to do things. Because I think, again, we, we talked quite a lot about how there's so many different levels of things. People are entering a diet change or exercise or cold or saunas, all different levels. So it's like, how do I know where to start and how do I don't how do I not overdo something or do it? and not get the benefits so that's coming out later but i've got plenty of free things and a lot of people have enjoyed the 10-step quantum kickstart because i think it's a good sort of gentle introduction into the new year so excellent well keep up the good work i enjoy all your content um, i do yeah, watch all the videos and sometimes i put in time stats myself to go back to a few points to re-listen and understand it a bit better so oh, it's, no, it's, it's good work you're doing Oh no, thank you, it's, and so are you. And I've really, I really enjoy um, I, because I've known you quite a long time, and I think you're doing a great job. And I'm glad your back's healed, and you know you're back on on form. So it's been really lovely to speak to you today. Andrew, cheers. Take care. Thanks. Build muscle and lose fat on the carnivore diet.